Good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you all. Uh, my name is Amy Stillman. I am the Director of Native American Studies, and I have the um, very delightful duty of opening this evening's program. Um, I, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Michigan is located on traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg people, the three fire confederacy of the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, as well as the Wyandotte nations. Lands for the university were ceded ceremonially through the treaty at the foot of the rapids in 1817 so that the children of those tribes could be educated. In the university's recently released Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion 2.0 Strategic Plan, the item named Honoring Article 16 is named as one of 20 campus-wide action items. And we, I assure you, we shall double down on the work of holding the university accountable. Okay. So welcome to the 2023 Berkhofer Lecture, the preeminent annual event organized by the program in Native American Studies here at Michigan. Supported by the generosity of the Tom Shack Family Fund, for which we are deeply grateful. The Berkhofer Lecture is named for Robert J. Berkhofer, Jr., a distinguished historian who taught at Michigan from 1973 to 1991 and offered some of the first courses on American Indian history. Past lecturers for the Berkhofer Lecture have included literary and scholarly giants such as Scott Momaday, Joy Harjo and Robin Wall Kimmerer. We have also showcased breakthrough literary talent, such as Tommy Orange, Mary Catherine Nagel, and now Angeline Bouye. All of us in Native American Studies at Michigan are pleased to welcome you all this evening, including those of you who are joining us online from near and far. The invitation to join our live stream was sent out statewide. <laughs> Tonight's Berkhofer Lecture will be followed tomorrow by a day of activities for Native American youth from across southern Michigan. While on campus, they will visit two Native American exhibits at the Museum of Art across the street. They will enjoy a lunch gathering with Angeline Bouilly. They will tour the campus and attend panel discussions with U of M Native American students. I'd like to acknowledge the collaboration of participation in planning from the Rackham Graduate School, the U of M Museum of Art, the Center for Educational Outreach, Multi-Ethnic Student Affairs, the RISE Center for Research for Indigenous Social Action and Equity, and the Office of Government Relations. Funding for these activities, and this is the important thank you, um, funding for these activities has been provided by the Arts and Resistance Theme Semester, Rackham Graduate School, the Office of Multi-Ethnic Student Affairs, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Center for Education of Women, and the Department of English Language and Literature. And we thank these sponsors for making this, these events of these two days possible. I also want to um, thank the organizations and units who are participating in our information Fair, which is at the back of the room, which showcases some of the native interest, teaching and research activities that are going on um, across our campus, and they are not insubstantial. It's really great, great time to be at Michigan. And oh, of course, a huge shout out to the members of the Native American Student Association for all of your support tonight. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, I've also been asked to remind you that there is a QR code for an evaluation, event evaluation form. Um, we hope it will be projected on screen afterwards, but it is available outside on the table, and we would appreciate your feedback um, after. And also, um, Angeline Bui will be signing books after she speaks. And, but in the meantime, too, we have food. Please, um, please do enjoy and make yourselves comfortable. Okay, and now on to our main event. It is my pleasure to call upon my very distinguished colleague, Matthew Fletcher, to do the honors of introducing this evening's speaker. Matthew Fletcher is a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. At U of M, he is a professor in the Department of American Culture, and he is also the Harry Burns Hutchins Collegiate Professor of Law in the law school. Yeah. It doesn't stop there. Beyond Michigan, he is Chief Justice of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians, the Porch Band of Creek Indians, and the Grand Traverse Band, and he is also an appellate judge of another 10 tribes. Busy man, but very distinguished colleague, Professor Fletcher. I'm not used to reading introductions. I usually make it up as I go, but I will do this today. Angeline Bouley, a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, is a storyteller who writes about her Ojibwe community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The daughter of a traditional firekeeper, Angeline also acknowledges uh, being shaped by a network of strong Kwewag. She currently lives in southwest Michigan, but her home will always be Bawating and Sugar Island. Angeline has a lengthy record of service to Indian education at the tribal, state, and national levels. She served as education director to the Sault Ste. Marie tribe and sat on the board of regents of the Bay Mills Community College then was appointed as the director for the Office of Indian Education at the United States Department of Education. Firekeeper's Daughter is her debut novel and was an instant number one New York Times bestseller. The book has received numerous awards, including the Walter Dean Myers Award for Outstanding Children's Literature, the Prince Award, and the William C. Morris Award for Young Adult Debut Literature. It was also named an American Indian Youth Literature Award Honor Book. It is the 2023-24 Michigan Great Read by Michigan Humanities. Her second novel, Warrior Girl Unearthed, was released earlier in 2023 and is another number one New York Times bestseller. Angeline will be accepting the Boston Globe Horn Book Award in a ceremony tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming Angeline Bouley. Buju Anin, Angeline Bully, Misko Makokwe Nadishnakas, Makwadotam Bawating and Donjaba, Chimagwech. Um, hello everyone, I'm Angeline Bully. I am Bear Clan and I'm from uh, Bawating, the place of the rapids, uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you tonight. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, if I wear my glasses, I see every face. If I don't, um, <laughs> I might not be able to see anything else, but I, I, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> I'm going to start out with, um, this is something that uh, my publisher put together 
uh, for Target stores. It says strong Ojibwe women are like the tide, reminding people of forces too strong to control. Weak people fear that strength. Thinking of my mother. I am thinking of my mother when the blast changes everything. And that begins my book. Uh, also goes into uh, Donna Fontaine saying, I began as a secret and then a scandal. My own story started much earlier. Um, my father is Ojibwe, and he left Sault Ste. Marie as a young man and joined the Navy. He met my mom, who's non-native, and uh, um, raised us in a little town in southwest Michigan that when I graduated high school, I swore I would never return. I just thought there had to be more um, excitement to life than a one-stoplight town that turned to a blinker at midnight. Um, spoiler alert, I now live a block away from my parents, and so you can go home again. Uh, but um, my mom and dad, so they love stories. They are both voracious readers. My dad left school after eighth grade, and he is one of the most well-read individuals I know. And my mother, um, talk about opposites attract. My dad uh, left the Navy and became a truck driver, uh, cross country, long haul, and my mom doesn't drive at all. And so each Saturday, she would take my siblings and I, uh, we would walk like a mama duck and our little ducklings, and we would uh, have to hit the post office before noon and the bank before noon, and then we could go to the library. And our public library, uh, so it, this is about a mile walk, and we, my siblings and I would ha each have our tote bags, and we could check out whatever books we wanted to. And so, of course, I, you know, uh, every Nancy Drew book, uh, every Hardy Boys, Dana Girls, all these mysteries that I loved. Um, but I also remember checking out books about English royalty, about roses, about architecture, um, and I am just so thankful that my parents gave us the gift, the best gift, which is the freedom to read. As long as we were willing to haul everything in our tote bags, there was no limit. <laughs> um, two really important things happened to me when I was a senior at New Buffalo High School. Um, the first is that that was the first time I ever read a book that featured a Native American as the main character. Um, now, I love every book that Lois Duncan has written, um, except for Stranger With My Face, which was the book. And um, I, can't, I couldn't explain at the time why I started to read the book filled with such excitement and realizing, wait, this is the first time I a, a character's a main character was native um, and about quickly into the book I realized um, it wasn't a positive experience uh, it was written by someone who's not native and the the storyline included some kind of embarrassing stereotypes. Um, I just remember feeling kind of cringy after reading it um, and feeling like, uh, I know now that it was not good representation.
books for children and teens, uh, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop has written that books for children and teens serve as windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. So mirrors that, you know, we can see ourselves reflected in the pages of a book and uh, windows that we can see into the lives of other people very different from our own, uh, from our own selves. And sliding glass doors through the safety of the pages of a book, we can step into characters' lives very different from our own and we can connect with our humanity. Um, we can find commonalities. So um, I spoke recently at the um, University of Wisconsin at Madison, and their School of Education has the Cooperative Children's Book Center, which has been analyzing books for children and teens um, for a few decades, quite a few decades. But in 2002, that's when they started separating out the, uh, or keeping track of the data, books about Native Americans, you know, featuring a, a character who's Native, um, and, and books written by Native Americans. So um, the actual percentage of books featuring a Native character it hasn't changed all that much since 2002. Um, we're lucky if we do hit 1%, usually we're uh, less than 1%. So out of the 3,500 books each year published in the US uh, for children and teens, um, around 65 books um, feature a native main character. And when uh, the CCBC, started to um, keep track of this data, nine times out of 10, it was a non-native person that was getting the book deal, book deals. And we've always had incredible storytellers. That's how we survived, was our ability to tell stories and share. And um, we come from that rich oral tradition. And so the thought that nine times out of 10, it wasn't us telling our stories. The other important thing that happened to me when I was a senior in high school is that um, my skin was flawless and my hair was so lush. I just, anyway, but that's, we won't get into, that, that's not this talk, okay. But um, my really good friend went to a school nearby, right across the Indiana border, and um, she told me about this new boy senior year. She thought he might be my type and, um, I was intrigued because, yeah. Um, but then I found out that he didn't play football and he hung out with the really hardcore partiers that we called stoners back then. And so I never met him. But a month before graduation, my friend said that uh, there had been a huge drug bust in their community and it turned out that the new, new boy was actually an undercover police officer. Yes, <laughs> and this was right before, this was a couple years before the original 21 Jump Street uh, TV series with Johnny Depp. So I just was um, astonished that a young looking law enforcement officer could pose as a high school student as part of an undercover investigation. I remember thinking, what if I, what if we had met? And what if we liked each other? Or what if it wasn't that we liked each other, but what if he needed my help? Um, and then this spark of an idea that has stayed with me since 1983 was, why would some undercover drug investigation need the help of an ordinary 18-year-old Ojibwe girl? Well, wow. Let's flash forward. Uh, I went to Central Michigan University. Uh, I have both of my degrees from there. I ended up working for the Saginaw Chippewa uh, Indian community in Mount Pleasant. And my first job there, I was a um, student parent advocate. And so I was a tribal employee, but I had an office in the local 
uh, West Intermediate School, and I had about 45 7th and 8th grade students, Native students, and I would, um, you know, do tutoring, I would, um, you know, check on attendance, um, and I would observe things, and I would see that maybe a whole group of kids would be goofing off in the hallway. But it always seemed like it was the one Native student that would get pulled aside for disciplinary action. And so I would be maybe the only friendly face in that disciplinary meeting. I would also let parents know what their rights were in those meetings. And I would, um, my goal was to make sure that every student that started that school year would finish that school year. And, um, There was a young man that I really uh, liked, and he was quiet, um, you know, hardly ever said a word, but just, you know, polite, quiet, kept his head down. But every time it seemed like he would step out of line, someone was right there to catch him. And finally, one day, he just had enough. He was in eighth grade, and um, finally, one day, he was like, that's it, I'm out of here. And I remember kind of, um, you know, walking beside him and as he's headed towards the, the, you know, front doors of the school and I'm saying, you know, what could we do to um, get through the date? No, no, what could we do to just get through this class period? What are some things, you know, and really just trying to last ditch effort for him not to leave. And we get to the front door and the school principal had, was opening the door and the young man walked out and we watched him walk down the walkway and then head for the three mile walk to the res. And he said, um, the school principal said, what a shame, so much potential. And I wished that I had the courage in that moment to say, you are literally holding the door open for him. We had plenty of opportunities um, to reach him it really galvanized that what I wanted to do was to uh, dedicate my career to working in Indian education, trying to improve public school education for Native students and for all students to learn more about Native peoples, our communities. Um, the more local, the better. The more modern, the better. Um, and I had a really great career. I ended up working as the tribal education director for uh, the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, and then I served in the same position for uh, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians, and then finally being able to work, uh, live and work in my own tribal community for about 12 years. And um, during that time, I might not have been writing the story, but I was still, I was creating it. So when I would be that um, young person reading Nancy Drew, I considered it a challenge with each new book. Um, could I solve that mystery before Nancy did? Um, and so I started to, um, and then I always say, joke around that I was raised on, you know, mystery thrillers. Um, and CBS soap operas. So uh, I knew about like uh, foreshadowing and you know little uh, red herrings and uh, uh, Friday cliffhangers. So um, I, let me see, let me, my mouth is really dry. So in working in these different uh, native communities in Michigan, um, I, I would see different experience, I would see different situations. Um, I was learning a lot more about my uh, culture and I started to reverse engineer that spark of an idea for this story. And what I figured out was, well, what if it was a federal drug investigation on a reservation? And what if the drug had um, some, a recipe that could be tweaked or manipulated? And what if there was some cultural component um, about this? And um, what if this 18-year-old Ojibwe girl was a whiz at chemistry, but she also knew about um, 
traditional medicines, how we use plants for healing. And what if this young woman also knew her culture and language and was connected to everybody and everything? Uh, she really would be the ideal confidential informant for a federal investigation. But on my reservation and many others, uh, the FBI and the Bureau of Indian Affairs aren't necessarily the good guys. So why would this young woman uh, feel compelled to help with this investigation? Okay, let's reverse engineer again. What if she witnessed a devastating murder that was connected to um, this deadly drug? And so what if she decided that she would, um, she wanted to get to the bottom of who was involved in this uh, 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 drug? and that she would conduct her own investigation parallel with the FBI, and she would decide what information she would share with them and what information she would hold back. Because she wasn't just protecting her tribal community, she was also protecting indigenous knowledge. I'll take you back to Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop and her um, often quoted about books for children and teens serving as windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. Dr. Debbie Reese, who runs the American Indians in Children's Literature blog, she has taken that and said, some of those windows need curtains. This is why representation in literature for children and teens is so important. Um, I had to decide what information I would include in my story, and, um, and I realized that I was protecting indigenous knowledge, and that came into some of my uh, decisions I made as an author. Um, so yeah, it only took over two decades for me to kind of reverse engineer how the story might be plausible and how I could, you know, write it. Um, but I hadn't studied creative writing in school. I was always good at writing, um, but pursuing a career as, as a, an author wasn't anything that I had really thought of. But I remembered seeing an interview or hearing an interview that singer-songwriter Billy Joel did, and he talked about how he dreamt in music, and that when he would wake up, he'd rush to his piano and, um, play what he had been listening to, um, you know, in his dreams. And I remember talking with one of my friends about that, and she said that she dreamt in um, regalia designs, and I thought that was really cool, um, that something that you're so passionate about, that it finds a way to come out in your dreams. Um, and I thought, I guess I always thought everyone uh, dreamt in stories, because I, I did. But the more that I would talk to people about the things they were passionate about and maybe what they dreamt of where they just felt so alive, and I realized that most people don't dream in, um, like, character arcs and plot, yeah, and um, cliffhangers and, um, yeah. So I thought, well, maybe I am a storyteller then. So um, I also rethought my experiences, and I realized that every single job I've ever had, no matter what my title was, uh, I always wrote grants as well. It was the only way my programs would really uh, expand was if I found the funding for it. And I thought about it, and um, Grant writing is a form of short storytelling in 40 pages or less, plus attachments. And um, I was really good at short storytelling in that format. You're, cre writing a, a, you're creating a compelling narrative about your tribal community and the issue that you want to address and how you involved community members in coming up with your project approach. Um, and you know what um, you know what measures, what outcomes are you looking for? Uh, what's your plan for keeping the project on 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 track? And what uh, s steps are you going to take if if things start to veer off? Um, and why should you be trusted with the funding? Uh, I was a really good grant writer. 
And so I thought, hmm, okay, just because my training as a writer, uh, I had never heard of a novelist that had that kind of background that I did, but I realized that did, just because I hadn't seen it before didn't mean that my experience uh, wasn't as valid as anyone else's. Um, the other thing that finally at age 44, I decided to start writing. Uh, my two sons were in high school and my daughter was a preteen. And I told her this idea that I had for this uh, story of this, I called it like indigenous Nancy Drew meets 21 Jump Street. Um, but I told my daughter about this and she said, mom, that sounds even better than Twilight. And um, <laughs> That's a pretty powerful, you know, vote of confidence from a preteen. So, with that, um, you know, when I started writing, uh, it was 2009. <laughs> I was married. I had three kids. I lived in Sault Ste. Marie. I worked for my tribe, um, and I just started by, I don't know. Uh, I just thought. I give myself permission to write the world's worst draft of a story. And if it goes no further than that, um, that I can live with that, like that failure, failure. I can live with that easier than I can live with the regret of always having this story idea that just won't leave me. And um, the regret I would feel if I never, ever tried. So I did, uh, in 2009, I wrote the world's worst first draft, um, and it was definitely not young adult. But um, I, you know, I set it aside for a few weeks, and I read it again fresh with writer's eyes, and I saw, you know, there's something to this story. Um, this draft, didn't, I didn't, you know, uh, get it, but, Maybe if I improve my ability to write dialogue, maybe if I research this element, maybe if I do this. And so then I would, um, you know, take a pause, get things, you know, uh, do some more research, and then um, attack my next draft. And when I started, I honestly, you know, my daughter was a preteen, and I thought, okay, it'll take me a year or two to write this, and then another year or so to get an agent and then get it. By the time my daughter is in high school, this story will be ready for her. And I, as you can see, I did not count on it taking 10 years of writing and revising. And by the time my book did publish, she was a senior in college. But um, I just, each draft, I felt stronger. Um, I, I did more research. Um, I realized maybe in some of my, you know, those middle drafts, it was like, I'm going to share every bit of cultural information I have. Um, and it wasn't until I was, you know, well into this process that I was like, wait, there's some things I need to um, hold back. And, um, and I, I don't think I would have written as nuanced um, and layered and complex a story. Um, I'm glad that those previous drafts did not get published. And I'm glad that I um, had the life experience and everything that just culminated in that, that final draft. Um, so about halfway through that 10 year process, um, I learned about the hero's journey, which I first thought that I discovered it, but then I quickly found out that no, it's a real thing and it's someone else studied it be, way before I did. Or I had one kid that loved Harry Potter and one kid that loved um, Star Wars. And I remember telling them, like, you do realize that the first Harry Potter movie and um, Star Wars A New Hope Episode Four. It's the same story, um, <laughs> like even to the point of uh, the seemingly average person gets, you know, this call to adventure, and they even have their uncle like refuse the call on their behalf, but then guide, guided by this like mentor person, and um, you know, they enter this unknown world and they discover previously hidden talents. They make friends. They also gain enemies, um, and they're on a quest for something that they think that they want. 
But when they finally do face that final true adversary, whether or not they're successful in getting what they thought that they wanted, um, the, sometimes they get what they needed and not what they wanted. Uh, they're forever transformed by this journey that they've gone through. And even when they do return to the ordinary world, um, they're forever changed. They're not the same person. And we see the hero's journey in so many popular movies um, and books. Uh, but I thought about we indigenous people, we have our hero stories too. So we Ojibwe people have um, a, a character, uh, Nana Bush or Nana Bojo, and he is on this epic journey and he'll encounter rabbit and you learn like how rabbit got its long ears or how, how porcupine got its quills. And sometimes, a lot of times, the stories are um, at his expense. Uh, so sometimes he's kind of goofy, but um, so we have these stories, and I started to think about this ordinary 18-year-old Ojibwe girl and how I would frame that story, how I would tell the hero's journey from her perspective. And, you know, that five years into that 10-year process of writing and revising, I had my eureka moment. Um, so I had seen this uh, graphic depiction of the hero's journey, and it looks like a pizza cut into four slices. Um, and the main plot points are um, around the, uh, the edge of it. And then right after that, I was searching for something else, and I came across the Ojibwe medicine wheel. And this one is by Keweenaw Bay Indian community. And usually I see it, and it's tilted on its axis a bit, but this time, I saw it and it was the same slices as and same angles as as the hero's journey and I thought you know our Ojibwe medicine wheel has so many teachings you know our four cardinal directions um, the four stages of life um, the four seasons four traditional colors uh, four traditional medicines just it's just so rich with teachings and I thought, what if I overlaid it? And I used the medicine wheel as a cultural framework for telling the hero's journey from this ordinary 18-year-old Ojibwe girl's uh, experience. And that was the day that I knew my book would get published. I just knew I had never seen that done before, and it was exactly the type of story I would have loved to have read as an 18-year-old or in high school. Um, so that only took, um, gosh, <laughs> it, like 35 years at that point from idea to, um, I pitched my book on, um, my manuscript on Twitter. I don't recommend that now. Um, but at that time, uh, I participated in a one-day pitching event where um, this one was hashtag DV pit, diverse voices pitch. Getting back to that, you know, only 1% of all books published for children and teens features a Native American as the main character. And so on this day between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., uh, you tweet out the elevator pitch of your story. And so I pitched out, you know, when 18-year-old Donis witnesses the murder of a loved one, she must use her science, geekery, and knowledge about her Ojibwe culture to protect her tribal community before she loses anyone else. Well, literary agents looking to sign new clients and editors at publishing houses looking to publish um, authors. Uh, if, if they liked that tweet, it was considered an invitation to follow up with them. I had 60 literary agents and 20 editors at publishing houses that liked that tweet. It took me a month to research all 60 literary agents and come up with my top 10 dream list and I added two more agents, so I had a top 12. And um, my path to publication is the exact opposite of the phrase, hurry up and wait. Mine is the opposite. My, my journey was um, decades of this 
roller coaster, taking a really, really decades long journey to get to the top of that very first peak. And you know you're getting close when you hear that like clink, clink, clink. And then it took off. Um, within two weeks of querying my top 12 um, list, I signed with an I signed with a literary agent. I worked over the summer of 2019 on some uh, revisions based on my agent's feedback. And um, we took the manuscript out on submission uh, in the fall. And two weeks later, I, there was a 12 bidder auction for the North American publishing rights to my book. And um, I, I sold the publishing rights um, at auction for seven figures, so in excess of a million dollars. Now, I was a nobody in the publishing world. Like this deal caught people by, you know, they were, they were like, wait, what is happening? Um, I had not graduated from a prestigious, um, you know, Master of Fine Arts program. I, I hadn't studied, create. I didn't come from, you know, the uh, pipeline of the prestigious uh, writer retreats and workshops and that. Um, I was a nobody. Um, and two weeks later, uh, I sold the film rights to the Obamas for a Netflix series. And Reese Witherspoon picked my book for her young adult book club. And a few days before my book uh, was published, I was interviewed by Robin Roberts on Good Morning America. Um, and she dressed specifically to match the graphics. And she was just a very lovely person. Um, so 36 years after the spark of an idea, um, my book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's been on the list a total of 31 weeks, not all consecutively. Um, and it's won some incredible awards. And one of my favorite accolades is it was Time Magazine um, named it one, it's number 100 on the list of 100 best young adult books of all time. And when I blasted that um, news on all of my social media, I had one of my friends message me and she said, I really love your book. Um, I think it should be higher than number 100 though. And I replied back, um, the list is in chronological order. It starts with um, Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. And it ends with um, Firekeeper's Daughter. <laughs> so I'm very happy. And my book had only been out two months at that time. So I was like, I'm really good with being number 100. Um, I have since uh, signed 22 foreign rights deals. And so Firekeeper's Daughter is being translated and published across the globe. Um, you know, I love, you know, the, the awards and the, the bestseller. I, don't get me wrong, I love that. But to me, what it shows is, um, so the Irish writer James Joyce, he wrote that in the particular, we find the universal. And what these um, awards and, and success means to me is that publishing is a business and that a story about an 18-year-old ordinary Ojibwe girl from a reservation, from a, a tribe in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, that um, a story about, you know, written by someone from that community, um, that it can show that it's a commercial and literary success. Um, it means that more nobodies like me are going to get their shot at publishing and that we can turn that nine times out of ten the story that the author that would get the deal was is non-native we're flipping that and now you look at the list of um, books that are being published and there are so many 
Native authors that are finally getting their shot. And so I'm so happy that to be part of this um, wave that I sincerely hope that the push to publish underrepresented voices is not a blip. Um, I hope that it's something that we um, can hold on to. So it's been nonstop roller coaster ride uh, since 2021. I love meeting with readers and connecting with them. My favorite things are when um, a teacher says that a reluctant reader, uh, that they couldn't wait to get through my book and they were like eager to talk about it in class. Um, I spoke at uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College earlier this spring and there was an older gentleman that came up to me afterwards and I signed his book and he said, I just wanted you to know that this is the first book I've read since high school. And I just was like astonished in, in, in that, well, why my book or why, you know, this? Um, so uh, when my book came out, we were a year into the pandemic. And so for the first six months, most of my events, we would be masked um, if we did do them in person. And it happened, it's, it's happened a number of times uh, that a Native woman um, would come up to me and want to tell me what the book meant to her. And she would get choked up and I would get choked up because I wanted to ask her, did I get our story right? And she would let me know that she felt seen. And that's, um, that was really good, very special. Um, my second book uh, came out May 2nd. It too has been on the uh, New York Times bestseller list. Um, and it also recently, uh, it won the Boston Globe's Horn Book Award. And so I'll be accepting uh, the award tomorrow. Um, uh, it's a virtual event, so I'll be streaming it from here. Uh, <laughs> but if I pitched my first book is Indigenous Nancy Drew Meets 21 Jump Street. I pitched Warrior Girl Unearthed as Indigenous Lara Croft. But instead of raiding tombs, the main character is raiding museums and private collections to retrieve our stolen ancestors and sacred items that have no business being in a museum when there's a federal law that says tribes and other eligible entities have every right to um, request the return of ancestors and sacred items. Um, oh, and she's 16, so none of her heists go the way that she plans. So, yeah. But um, uh, this is me with my dad, uh, Matthew, uh, alluded to him, yes, my dad is um, a firekeeper in our community and he helps other communities too. So he strikes that ceremonial fire when we have ceremony, um, when we hold a language conference or a fasting camp or a funeral, um, you know, that fire is struck and it, it burns day, day and night um, until the event is done. And um, I've sat with my dad um, I sat with my dad at the fire uh, many times, and he tells stories while he's there. And he tells stories that he never told us when we were growing up. And each time I sit with my dad on the fire, it's like, um, you know, learning so much more about him. Uh, and I'm just grateful. The picture of us, uh, that was, May 6, or March 16th, 2021, uh, I had found out that my uh, virtual book launch was gonna be um, delayed by two days because the person that was gonna be interviewing me wasn't available. So I decided to launch my book in my tribal community. So we drove up to Sault Ste. Marie and um, I was able to sign books and be there in my community for this, um, for this book. Uh, reaching uh, the world. So um, with that, I think we're going to uh, do a little bit of question and answer. And what I'd like to leave you with is, um, 
Every time I hear a land acknowledgement, I want there to be action tied to it. And so I encourage you, every time you hear a land acknowledgement, read a book by an indigenous author. It doesn't cost you anything. Request it from the library, um, purchase it if you can, but then rate it online, review it online, and recommend it to people. Um, those activities cost you nothing, but that's gold to indigenous authors like myself who are showing publishing that our books, that there's a market for our stories and that our stories are best told when we are deciding. Um, I had a mantra during that 10 years of writing and revising that I still live by now and it's, um, I write to preserve my culture and I edit to protect it. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions and miigwech again for the opportunity to share with you tonight. Miigwech, Anne-Line. Uh, we have microphones, so if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We're happy to deliver a mic to you, and please wait for the mic. All right, awesome. Uh, what would you say is your, do you have a tip for getting past writer's block? Um, yeah, I try to figure out why I'm having writer's block. Um, if it's that I just don't know what the next, se that scene is, but I know the one that comes after it, I'll skip over. And then a lot of times writing the next scene that I know for sure helps me to go back and fill in. Um, other times, like if I'm writing a really, you know, my books contain some really intense topics, teen dating violence, um, suicide, uh, you know, sexual assault. Um, and, and if I'm going to be writing a really intense scene, I make sure that I'm well rested, that I've eaten well, that I, you know, that I'm in a good place. And if I'm not, if I'm feeling tired or run down, I don't write that scene on that day. I wait until I'm in a good place. Um, and then uh, I try to be creative in all different ways because sometimes that's just the conduit to, you know, it's starting to flow. So I'll create playlists of different characters. You know, like what, what music do they listen to? I always feel like if I know what music they listen to, then I, I know insight into that character. So I just, um, uh, find ways to be creative and, and think about story. And my favorite thing, absolutely, is when I wake up uh, and that space in between sleep and wake when the perfect line of dialogue will come to me or the answer to a plot hole or, or something. And I just, I just love that when that happens. Um, so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but um, I am curious um, as to kind of where you draw the line between what knowledge to share and what to protect. Well, you know, I think when I was developing my craft and I was like eager to share everything that I knew and then at a certain point I realized like, wait, I shouldn't be describing what happens inside that sweat lodge. Only, like, um, there's a responsibility, and I don't believe ceremony should be shared with anyone outside of that ceremony. But I do know the healing power of our ceremonies, and so in Firekeeper's Daughter, there's a yellow pansy ceremony that is held um, towards the end of the book, and um, I invented that because I, um, I really felt it, it served an important purpose, uh, but I didn't want to take anything from an actual, anything that I had actually been um, a part of. So, yeah. <laughs> and that's something that indigenous authors 
that's something that we do. Like, I'm answerable to my community. I'm answerable to, you know, I always think of, like, what one particular cousin of mine, like, what she's going to think about this or that I put it in there. And, and I always feel like I have to be able to say why I did. And um, that's something that a non-native person writing a story set in my community doesn't have that same sense of obligation um, or commitment to the community. And that's why representation in books for children and teens is so important. Can you give us a list of resources or ways that we can find um, books not only for the children and young adults, but for adults as well. Absolutely. So I mentioned uh, Dr. Debbie Reese and her blog, um, American Indians in Children's Literature. And each year she comes up with a best of list, and it's the best picture books, the best um, you know, chapter books, uh, middle grade, young adult, graphic novel, nonfiction, and adult crossover. And those lists are available. And she also, if there's a book that she does not recommend, she includes her review, her analysis of why. And I think sometimes teachers are so afraid of doing something um, wrong or getting it wrong that they opt not to include, or they're you know hesitant. But a resource, a free resource like this, you know, blog spot. Um, you know, it really helps you to learn how to, what questions to ask when you're selecting a book for, um, for a lesson. Hi, um, I have a couple questions. The first one might be real quick is, uh, what are all the languages like that um, are not common that are translated, that your book's been translated into? So like, have, is, has it been translated into indigenous languages and such, or lesser language, lesser known languages? Um, it has not been translated into an, in, uh, like it's not translated into Ojibwe. Um, if it was, it, it would be like a, a 10 volume, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, gosh, everyone, every foreign deal so far, they've used the same cover art and the same title, except for France changed the name to A Dose of Rage. Um, and yeah. And, uh, and so it's really neat to see like the Dutch version. Um, everything's translated into Dutch except for the Ojibwe words. And it's, and I, I have, you know, a deal in South Korea and Japan and Brazil and Spain, Italy, um, you know. Okay. Um, the second question is, um, have you thought about having it in a curriculum any for schools at all? Or, um... uh, yes. So uh, my publisher's website, uh, Macmillan is who I'm published with, they worked with, um, they Produce, they have a free downloadable uh, book discussion guide for like book clubs and then a teacher's guide that's aligned with uh, Common Core uh, standards. And so there's uh, resources there for on both books. And then uh, Firekeeper's Daughter being named as the Great Michigan Read, um, uh, they worked with Eric Hemingway uh, from Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians, and uh, they uh, have a free resource, and it's a guide for um, you know readers, and then a guide for teachers, and it just provides so much context and good information about Native communities in Michigan. So, if someone wanted to get your book into a curriculum, is there a person to contact on your website? Yeah, yeah. My website is angelinebully.com, and um, my publisher's website, uh, they have the, all of those, that information resources, too. With so many drafts, how did you know that it was the final draft? Okay, um, if writing is an exercise, I felt that I had um, written to the point of exhaustion. I could not think 
of any other way to improve upon the story. I, I just couldn't think of anything else I could do. Um, and so that's when I, yeah. Of course, after I got my book deal, I ended up adding, changing a lot and rewriting about 75% of it and <laughs> adding 100 more pages and yeah. And then for the second book, I only had one year to write it. So it was a much different um, writing experience. And then it hasn't been announced publicly yet, but it will be shortly. Uh, my publisher preemptively offered me a deal for books three and four. So it'll be a four book uh, set. Well, uh, perhaps one more question, and then um, I'm happy to answer individual questions during the signing line. Um, so who wants the responsibility of the last question? Hi, thank you so much for coming and talking and telling us your stories. Um, I really love the book, and my, my wife really loved the book, and she's actually, um, presenting on your book at our local library, so that's very exciting. Um, but I just wanted to ask, you know, as somebody who has done on-the-ground work and creative work, um, and this is like an oversimplified question, but is there, I know there are pros and cons to both, um, on-the-ground work and like creative work and art, um, but which do you prefer and why? Can you repeat your question? Yes. Um, so you've done like on the ground work, like talking and, and, and working within your community. And you are also, you know, a writer, a creative writer and, you know, expressing, um, you know, care for your community in that way. Um, and, you know, on the ground work can be kind of exhausting, but you're working directly with your community and art sometimes can be seen as, you know, not direct work. So I was just wondering, you know, what you think of that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could not have written this story without having done the on the ground work. Um, if, I, if I had tried to write the story even at 18, it would have been a very sappy romance. Um, uh, and, and so I really needed that on the ground work and um, yeah, to, to be able to write the story that it, you know. And it, I do think sometimes that through the power of a book um, that I've been able to reach more people um, with the issues that I care about than I could than even when I was working at the my dream job in Washington DC at the Department of Education. So I really do believe that art is a powerful um, force and stories are good medicine and so. Well, thank you. Thank you, Angeline, and thank you, everybody, for being here um, this evening. For those who would like to have their book signed, we will start the line here where I am now. If you haven't received a free copy of one of her books, you're free to request one. Again, we have large print for accessibility. Um, we also have ebooks um, for accessibility. If you can start the line here, I will hand you a 